Hi, my name is Dr. Harvey, and I'm here in the Chem 60 lab to walk you all through experiment number nine. So the first reading we're going to take is I'm taking a clean, dry, large test tube and a 150 mil beaker, going to put it on the scale, and I'm going to press tear. So that's going to zero it out. Once it reads zero, I'm going to remove the test tube and beaker from, my, from the scale. I'm then going to add between 1.0 and 1.6 grams of sodium bicarbonate. This is commonly known as baking soda. So I'm going to add about a scoop and a half to the test tube. In my experience, this is the appropriate amount. I will then put this back on the scale and this will correspond to your data point A for your lab student data. Now that I have my pre-weighed sodium bicarbonate in my test tube, I'm going to take a wash bottle filled with deionized water and add a little bit of water. The purpose of adding this water is to get every little particle of sodium bicarbonate that could be on the sides of the test tube into the bottom of the test tube and also to give the reaction enough solvent so that when you produce your sodium chloride product, it will indeed be dissolved. Now I've taken some dilute six molar hydrochloric acid and I've poured about one inch of hydrochloric acid in a small clean 50 ml beaker and added a dropper, a clean dropper. We're now going to get the mass of all of these items. So I'm going to carefully put the 50 ml beaker with the dilute HCl and the 150 ml beaker with the sodium bicarbonate and the water on the scale. And I had teared it already. And that is data point B. So data point B contains the 50 ml beaker the HCl, the clean dropper, the 150 ml beaker holding the test tube that contains the sodium bicarbonate and the water that you've added. So this is the mass of everything before the reaction. Now I've carefully removed the items from the scale. I've come back to my desktop and now I'm going to take a little bit of HCl and add it to the test tube containing the water and the sodium bicarbonate. And you just wanna add one drop at a time and observe. So I had one drop and I swirl and what do you see? Okay, observation bubbles, what does that mean? And our goal is to have this reaction go to completion. You can see as I swirl, we produce more bubbles. By swirling, I'm allowing the sodium bicarbonate that's in the bottom of the test tube to come up and react with the HCl that I've added. And I don't wanna to add too much HCl because if your reaction bubbles over the top of the test tube and spills onto the bench, that means you've lost possible reactant and product and you need to start over. So now that the bubbles have dissipated, I'm going to add another drop of HCl from my pre-weighed beaker and I'm gonna swirl. I can also hear the fizzing noise of that gas being produced. So think about the chemical reaction that we're performing here and what is that gas? You all should know that chemical formula. And I'm gonna keep doing this and it usually takes about 10 or 15 minutes to slowly add the HCl and force the reaction to go to completion. So how will I know the reaction's gone to completion? Well, you'll add HCl, and if all of the sodium bicarbonate has been reacted, there'll be no more bubbles produced because you've used all of your reactant. So right now, there are no new bubbles being produced, but that's because I've run out of HCl. I still have excess sodium bicarbonate in there. And again, the reason we don't have a whole lot of HCl at the start is because your test tube, the contents would bubble over and you would lose some of your products and possibly reactants. So I'm going to patiently keep doing this.
until the bubbles go away. I will also notice that the sodium bicarbonate, the white solid in the bottom, will have dissolved. And I'm swirling the test tube as I add the HCl to give the chance for the sodium bicarbonate to react. If I didn't swirl and I added the HCl, I wouldn't see bubbles and then I would swirl and the bubbles would be produced. So we'll try that next. Let's add one drop. Right, not a whole lot of bubbles, but when I swirl, then you can see those bubbles form. In order for a chemical reaction to occur, the reactants have to come in contact with each other and collide. So by swirling, you're allowing the reactants to react with each other. And the key with this lab is to have patience. The second you add too much HCl, your test tube bubbles over and you have to start over. I'm also being careful to make sure that the HCl doesn't spill onto the bench top. If it did, that would be a possible source of error. Because after I finish this reaction, I'm putting everything back on the scale and getting the mass after the reaction. And what's interesting is that mass is actually gonna be lower than the mass of everything before the reaction. And I know in a chemical reaction, matter is, con or, you know, matter is conserved. I'm not creating or destroying matter, I'm just rearranging bonds. Well, one of these products is actually leaving this test tube on purpose. Okay, so think about what product is that. I know the products I'm making are aqueous sodium chloride and gaseous carbon dioxide. So which product do you think is leaving the test tube and going into the air in this lab? Okay, so you get the picture. We're gonna keep doing this for a while. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the video. And once the reaction has come to completion, I will start again and we'll continue on. Okay, so the reaction has come to completion. I can show you how I know. I've got the contents of the test tube. I add one drop of HCl carefully and there's no new bubbles. I can carefully see, it looks like two liquids are mixing, but no new bubbles are forming. And as I swirl that test tube, no new bubbles formed. That means the reaction has gone to completion. All of the sodium carbonate has been dissolved and reacted, I only have products. So that one drop of HCl that I add, that is evidence that the chemical reaction has gone to completion. Now I'm going to carefully put my test tube back in my 150 ml beaker. I'm going to make sure my scale is teared. I'm now going to obtain data point C. So data point C, I'm carefully placing my 150 ml beaker with the test tube and the contents after the reaction, the 50 ml beaker with the HCl that's left over and that dropper. And I can carefully see that the contents are not touching the sides of that plastic shield. This is data point C. Again, data point C, I have my 150 ml beaker my test tube with the contents after the reaction, the 50 ml beaker, the excess HCl that I did not use, and that same original dropper, data point C. Now I'm back at the scale. I have zeroed the scale. I have my clean, dry evaporating dish, and I'm placing this on the scale. So this is the mass of the clean and dry evaporating dish. This is data point D you can see inside it is empty and clean. So that corresponds to your data point D. We're going to use this evaporating dish to evaporate off the contents from our reaction. So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna place that by my hot water bath that I have set up. So the Bunsen burner is on. I've got a small ring on the bottom, wire gauze, a 250 ml beaker filled with tap water because it boils more smoothly a larger ring around the beaker, and that's just to minimize the chance that I'm gonna accidentally knock it over. I'm going to get my contents of my test tube, carefully pour this into my evaporating dish. 
You want to be careful not to spill that. I'm then going to carefully place my evaporating dish on the top of that hot water bath. So what's going to happen over time, the water gets hot and boils. It's going to then create steam, which gets the evaporating dish hot. The reason we use an evaporating dish is because it can get really hot and it's not gonna break. And then inside you can see there's a liquid. Okay, that liquid contains water and the products of the chemical reaction. Um, I also, we can't see it, I have a little snorkel set up above the setup. So if there's any HCL fumes that are produced, they do not go into the lab. So we're gonna go ahead and let that sit and boil. It will take about 20 or 30 minutes. While this is happening, I'm gonna take my squirt bottle and make sure that the contents in the water bath don't get too low. So I can hold the squirt bottle and squirt in some water and make sure that boiling water stays right about halfway full. Okay, if you evaporate off all of the water and the water gets too low and you evaporate all of it, you could worry about that beaker on the bottom cracking. Okay, so we will come back in probably about 20 or 30 minutes and check out the contents of this evaporating dish. Just checking back in, and I can see the contents inside the evaporating dish. The majority of the water has evaporated and it looks like it's getting very close to dry. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes and we'll get that final mass. So now I'm checking back in and hopefully you can see with the camera, the contents inside the evaporating dish, it looks like just a white solid and I don't see any water. I don't see any moisture moving around, so I believe that we're done. I'm going to carefully turn off the gas valve. So remember, perpendicular is off. The flame has stopped, the water is still very hot. I'm going to let the evaporating dish cool for a little bit, just on that hot water bath. After it cools down some, I can carefully use hot hands to remove it and let it cool even more. After the evaporating dish has cooled, we'll dry off the bottom and get the mass. My evaporating dish is now cool. I'm going to carefully dry off the bottom because if there is any water left over, that would give us an inaccurate mass reading. Going to go back to my scale. It does indeed read zero. It zeroed from the last time. Zero it one more time just to make sure. And now this will be data point E. So data point E is the mass of my evaporating dish with the solid dried product. Just a note about, so make sure you record that your student data number. Um, just one note about using these digital scales. You know, once they're zeroed, let's say I want to determine the mass of something. I'm going to take, we'll just look at this evaporating dish. So in this case, again, this is not a number you're gonna use in your lab, 66.550 grams, 549, 548. So you need to stabilize. Once it stabilizes, you, when you're back in lab, you record all three digits past the decimal point. Okay, so when you come back to lab, you wanna make sure for a digital scale, every single digit you read is significant. You wanna record that and notice the units of grams.